Hey guys, welcome back. Well, this is a follow-up video to a video I made a little while ago where I was talking about some of the inconsistent results I was consistently getting when trying to use Nina and the autofocus routine with my SCT at full focal length with no focal reducer in the chain. Now that I've been out doing some testing, have changed some parameters, I wanted to share with you what I did to go from this curve to this curve on a consistent basis because perhaps this can help you guys out when you're trying to get focus with your SCT at long focal length. The first thing you probably want to do as a diagnostic tool is to set Nina to show detected stars and you can do this. This flag is off by default but if you click this to on Nina will annotate the image so that when you look at your image as it comes in it will show you which ones of these elements in here it picked out as a star and tell you the half flux radius that it identified for those stars. You can't read the half flux radius here, but there's a little text symbol underneath here that shows you what the half flux radius is, and it shows you what it's selecting as tar stars and what it's not selecting as a star. For example, these two stars here were, appear to have been ignored as part of this assessment process, and so that may be important to know. Another thing we'll get back to in a moment is this box around here. I'm selecting an inner crop to have the autofocus routine ignore stars in the outer boundary. First thing you do if you're having problems with the Nina autofocus and your SCT is to annotate the image and take a look at what it's picking out as stars and what it's giving to the autofocus routine to use as the raw materials for an autofocus. If it turns out it's picking out hot pixels or features that don't appear to be good stars, then that may be a big clue on how to solve the problem. All of the autofocus parameters that we're interested in, at least here, are set here with the Options tab and in the Autofocus tab over here, and in here you have them. So I made a number of changes. Some are significant and some are probably not that significant, but I'll just walk through the changes that I made from what I was doing when I was getting those inconsistent results to what I'm getting now, and then you can decide for yourself which ones of the items are important to change on your end versus not change. First thing I did was to increase the number of offset steps. Now I don't tend to use a lot of points on the curve. For my refractors I set this number to four. I get good results with that. In this case with the kind of inconsistent results I'm getting and in some cases it's because the HFR that's being analyzed and reported seems to have a lot of uncertainty. I went ahead and increased the baseline number of points on each leg of the hyperbola to five from four. Now in the process of doing that I also decreased the step size that I'm using in the autofocus routine. My main goal here is to ensure that the maximum autofocus half flux radius is roughly three to four times the minimum optimum focus half flux radius and that way it will ensure that there is a sufficient variation within the curve in order to fit the hyperbola to. So that's what I did here. These two things kind of go together. If you're picking more points on the curve and you want to keep this kind of relationship then you'll probably have to decrease the autofocus step size so that you stay within that range. Now you can go higher, there's nothing magical about four, but I'm just afraid that if you go too far out of focus that the half flux radius routines won't properly identify the true half flux radius of the star. And after all, we're talking about an SCT image here. So there are very few stars to start off with, and they have a large uh, center hole because of the center obstruction. The next thing that I should have done but did not do is change this parameter for what is an acceptable curve fit. Right now I'm using the default. In essence, this is a measure of how closely do the points, the HFR points versus focus or position, fall on a hyperbolic curve. And right now the, the default is set to 0.7, which has quite a bit of error in it. And I think in the future I'm going to be changing this to 0.9, but the results that I'm going to show you have this set at 0.7. But I think the 0.9 is a better number here. I changed the inner crop ratio to 0.8, which means that 80% of the width and 80% of the height of the sensor are being used to provide the stars for the autofocus routine. So in this case, 80% of the width and 80% of the height translates into about 64% of the image. Now you got to be careful with this when you're using an SCT at long focal length you've got very few stars to start off with. All I'm trying to do here is just cut out any 
stars that might have some aberration to them around the perimeter of the field of view. And Now the next thing I did was to come down here and highlight this luminance filter line and then press this button to select that luminance filter as my autofocus filter. So every time an autofocus is done, for instance it could be imaging in hydrogen alpha, when it has to do an autofocus it's going to switch the filter to the luminance filter, perform the autofocus, and then use the focus offsets that you have set over here to adjust back to the filter that you're currently using for imaging. Now in my case I have measured these filter offsets before with this particular focuser which seems to have fairly coarse steps and my ZWO filters I find that a filter offset of zero is seems to be okay for the filter set that I have and for this focuser. The next thing I did was to increase the exposure time for my autofocus runs. I was using I think originally four seconds and I upped it to six seconds and then finally I've changed it to eight seconds in order to make sure that I'm getting decent exposed stars for use in the autofocus analysis. The biggest thing that I've done that has really solved the problem is to dramatically increase the backlash setting that I'm using. It seems to be the big player here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now I'm using the backlash setting on the out side, which means that when an autofocus run begins, it moves the focuser out five times 20 steps. And then with the overshoot set to the outside, it will shoot beyond that 150 steps and then come back in 50, 150 steps and then that's where the autofocus run actually starts and from there the focuser is moved 20 steps for each condition when it takes an image and computes the HFR. I'm putting the outward movement in this box because of other concerns I have about my focuser but if you don't have those concerns then probably the best thing to do is to put the backlash setting and the inward movement. I'm pretty sure that increasing the backlash number is the big player and these others are just minor, probably still important, but minor players in the overall scheme of things. This is the SCT or cross-section through a typical SCT. If we move the focuser knob back here either by hand or with a mechanical system like I have with the Celestron focuser, and so what happens is as you turn this knob you're moving this threaded part here in and out causing the mirror to slide up and down along this shaft. Anytime you're going to allow this slip of this part here relative to the inner tube, you've got to have, through manufacturing of these two parts, you've got to have an outer diameter of this inner tube smaller than the inner diameter of this outer tube. And that free play is going to vary depending on which pieces are put with which other pieces. And so one SCT may have a great fit up and another SCT produced by the same manufacturer will have a, a slightly worse. For the kind of cost that we're paying for a baseline SCT like I have, you can expect the manufacturing tolerances to be a bit loose. And as a result, when you move this mirror in, maybe by just a little bit, you're gonna get some tilt because the force is being applied through this arm here back on one side of the primary mirror, there's going to be a little bit of tilt which could very well explain why I'm getting that odd behavior and perhaps why it is that a significantly large overshoot backlash setting can force the mirror to behave more consistently as it is pushed farther out and then pulled way back in that might be enough to deal with or at least to make this interface behave more consistently during a focus run. This is the first imaging night and one of the first focus runs that I made fairly early on at 7.11 here. I'm getting good engagement of the primary mirror and focuser and so I'm getting some good HFR data that follow this hyperbolic curve very well. The optimum focus point or minimum focus is just a little over four maybe about four and a half or so and the maximum out of focus is about 14 in this case so when I talked before about wanting to make sure that the maximum out of focus half flux radius is about three to four times the minimum in focus half flux radius this is what I'm talking about and this ensures that we've got enough data enough range here so that we can fit a curve and confidently know that that a hyperbola will fit the data. Right after performing this autofocus run, I just did another one as soon as this one finished. This one gave me an optimum focus point of 466, 
and I got 466 the second time. I did it a third time, and this time I got 468 instead of 466, which is fine. But in each of these cases, the data looked pretty good. And then I started the imaging session, and it was running autofocus runs about every hour or so. And you can see that I've got pretty decent results, except here I looked at these results, and uh, I got an outlier here. And if you look at just this, the data points here, as I was live at the time, this did not look terribly hyperbolic. And so I re-ran the case and found that the focus position that it found with this set of data was at 464, but when I re-ran it and got better a better set of data to uh, perform the uh, curve fit with, it gave me 457 as the or optimum focus point. So this made quite a bit of difference, and this is why I was suggesting that in the future I'm going to change my R squared number from the 0.7 to the 0.9 in the hopes that when it sees a result like this, it will kick this out and automatically rerun the autofocus. Continuing on through the night, you can see these are all the runs. We don't need to talk about each one of them, but by and large, you can see they are all fairly consistent. They all fit the hyperbolic curve fairly well. Finally, another one did crop up at 5.30 in the morning, and I got something of a more of a V-curve looking thing, even though this is a hyperbolic curve fit. And so it automatically redid the run immediately after seeing this result. But the interesting thing here is that the focus point it came up with this, this winky data here was 449. And when it reran the autofocus, it came up with 450. So in fact, this focus point was not that bad, but because the error exceeded the 0.7 limit that was originally specified, it did automatically kick off its own autofocus run. Starting on the second imaging night, the data look pretty good. They all follow the uh, consistent pattern of a high half-flux radius on the outside, and it moves in and swings through a minimum and comes back up the other side. So everything is looking pretty good all the way through the imaging session here until we begin the third night. And once again, I got a fairly winky looking result. Now this one passed the 0.7 R squared fit, but I think what happened here is I'm fairly early in the evening and it wasn't quite dark out so it still had a bit of light and I think that's what was tripping up the calculation of the half flux radius for some of these stars. Then about an hour later this is what the data looked like. So it went, went from uh, a looking more V curve like to a true hyperbolic curve just within a case of an hour and again I think that's all because it wasn't uh, dark enough to perform that autofocus run. Imaging throughout the third night, the data looked pretty good, although here, once again, this is where the R squared value of 0.7 might have allowed this one through, and it might have redone this curve and gotten a better result. It did finally finish up at 5 o'clock in the morning, roughly, with a pretty good hyperbola. And then starting the fourth imaging night, once again, the data look all very consistent. And finally, in the fifth night, we get, once again, consistent results and finally finishing up with maybe a bit more error here in this particular curve. But by and large, you can see that I'm getting very consistent, well, for me, much more consistent results than I had been getting up until that point. There, these curves are not quite as good as the curves I get consistently out of my smaller focal length refractors, but still there's much better than what I was getting consistently that led me to make all these changes and produce that other video. The Hocus Focus plugin that's new for Nina, this is currently under active development. It's probably working better for some refractors than it is for SETs, but I think this looks very promising. There's a lot of parameters that you're going to have to set. I haven't done this yet, but once you go through and fine tune these parameters for your particular telescope, and these numbers may vary from SET to a refractor, we can use the stars detected by Hocus Focus as part of the autofocus routine, and it may get even more consistent and better results. One of the things that in the feature list is in the future, uh, there could be this fast focus option. What I'm hoping will happen is that this will be the next big step in autofocus, where autofocus is just small increments of adjustment to a focus that's already pretty near focus, and I'm looking forward to that. Focusing an SET is a challenge, particularly the longer focal length you go, the more challenging it is because we've got fewer stars by and large. We've got dimmer stars because we're dealing with probably an F10 scope. We have larger stars because we're dealing with an F10 scope, and the stars can be more elongated. All of these things pose challenges to our 
half flux radius measurement algorithms. And then on top of all of that, you've got this free play mechanism within the primary mirror when you're turning the knob to move the primary mirror to achieve focus. So there are a number of things going on here that create challenges for an SST that we don't have for a refractor. Now, if you happen to see my most recent video where I talk about optimizing imaging system performance based on what your guiding performance is, one of the things that I learned in doing that study was that I'm not using my ST SCT properly. I need to be using the focal reducer and I need to be binning the uh, camera sensor in order to get the best imaging performance out of that system based on the guiding that I have. Well, if I do that, if I go to the focal reducer and I start bending the sensor, then I'm going to solve many of these initial problems. The fewer, the dimmer, the larger, and the elongated star part may be greatly reduced. It won't solve the free play in the mirror. The best option for a SCT focuser is to get one that moves the camera or perhaps the secondary mirror instead of moving the primary mirror. Now these focusers, there are some from Moonlight, Primalucia Labs has one, Optech has an interesting solution in which they move the secondary mirror instead of the camera or the primary mirror. So if you have more money than patience, this is the best way to go. For the rest of us, there are other options that do in fact move the primary mirror and they will and they do work. Pegasus Astro has a focus cube which does have an interface for the SCT. ZWO likewise has interface hardware for the SCT and those are both good focusers. I have a couple of the focus cubes on my refractors. They work great. I'm using the Celestron focus motor. I wouldn't recommend this if you haven't bought one. I would recommend maybe taking a look at ZWO as maybe an option if you're going to go with this moving the primary mirror version of a focuser instead of the more expensive versions up here that don't move the primary mirror. But these options will work. They just may require a little bit more tweaking. If you're having autofocus results that are a bit inconsistent like I was having, first and foremost, go and adjust the overshoot backlash to a high number. Now the 150 steps that I'm using, that's consistent with my Celestron focus motor if you have one of these, an Astro, uh, Pegasus Astro Focus Cube or ZWO EAF, then kind of backlash number you might need maybe on the order of 500 to 1,000 steps. If you've done that, you've convinced yourself that the backlash is not the issue, then you might want to turn your attention to some of the other things, such as limiting the autofocus to the luminance filter so you're getting the most light uh, to expose for the minimal amount of time. You might want to increase your autofocus exposure time, as I did. You can adjust the image stretch factor and black point to 0.1 and minus 2, respectively. This is a recommendation that's provided uh, by uh, Nina for light polluted skies. And so if you're having difficulty with autofocus, it may be because the stretched image that's being sent to the autofocus algorithm is having difficulty pulling stars out, and so using settings that are better suited for light polluted skies might help the autofocus routine properly identify stars, but you can figure out what it's doing by setting Nina to show and annotate the detected stars, and that might give you a big clue as to what's going on to make sure that it's seeing actual stars and that they are quote good stars that are being used for the autofocus algorithm. I'm going to keep my eyes posted on the developments of the Hocus Focus plugin. That may be the future of autofocus going forward. Well that's all I've got for today guys. Thanks for hanging in there. If you're having trouble with your autofocus just follow some of these steps and maybe you'll be ready for the next set of clear skies. See ya.